Welcome back, everyone, for our next presentation. We have Alex talking about our love-hate relationship with modules. Thank you, Alex. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so my name is Alex Baranowski, and uh, I will just get to the first slide. Uh, I'm working for a small company in Poland. Uh, it's called Linux. Uh, I'm doing mostly enterprise Linux and civil and tech stuff. Uh, and everything presented here is my own opinion. I do not represent company. Uh, uh, and I decided that I will use the Poland ball because the Poland ball was, is a meme that uh, was actually created to um, uh, <laughs> say bad things about Poland, but it backfired and it's quite popular. Um, so about this presentation, uh, the Poland ball will be the milk indicators. Uh, the one with the heart is obviously the love. Um, there is the normal Poland ball that will represent that, in my opinion, this just like information. And there will be the Poland ball that uh, is, uh, will represent this hate relationship with modules. And I divided my presentation into the three parts. The first one is the, a little bit of a theory about the modules, uh, the user perspective and maintainer perspective. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So, when it comes to the theory, so the first part, uh, this is the module definition from the Fedora modularity page, but uh, Fedora actually started the modules. And uh, module is a modular package, but instead of being only one RPM file, as non modular package would be, it represents a collection of one or multiple RPM packages and metadata files, which are the artifact of a module build process. The metadata of the module can define multiple RPMs and modules, which are bundled, bundled and installed on the host system. And this is where the problem, in my opinion, starts. Uh, and as I believe that um, uh, as an engineer, I will say a lot of uh, things that might be not like very correct, uh, not in the meaning of engineering, but uh, in the meaning that they, they won't be soft. So uh, in my opinion, this uh, definition of module uh, is bad because first of all, the modular package is typical name collision. We have the RPM packages and this definition once we have the RPM file. Uh, then the RPM package and if someone is not very um, if someone do, does not know what the RPM is, it's like one is the package and the module is the package. Uh, and what is even worse, that uh, when we have the collection and when people think about the module, sometimes they might get confused with uh, software collections uh, because module all is also the collection of software. Uh, the very next thing is uh, that the module uh, has one or multiple RPM packages, it's false because a module can be empty actually, uh, and metadata files. The thing that I also dislike is if we are trying to explain something and if we are saying that uh, there's a process of producing it, but uh, for example, my glasses, are, um, the glass, my glasses are the things that were made in the glasses producing process. It's like, yeah, it's like always. Uh, and uh, that the metadata of the module can define multiple RPM files and modules. Actually not. Uh, and we'll go to the metadata file. Uh, but before that, uh, too long, didn't read. The module is a way to provide software. And that's all that uh, you have to actually know about the modules. Um, before this presentation. And there are alternative, alternative ways to provide the software on Linux systems, and especially on enterprise Linux systems, Fedora systems. The first one uh, to provide a different version of software, it's alternatives program. For example, you can install the different Java version, versions, and you can then uh, change that version with alternatives, but the different version will be the default. Uh, we also have the name packages. So, for example, that conflict with each other uh, and they can conflict on the RPM level, but also uh, with the conflict. Uh, it's not a macro, it's a, a directive. 
Uh, but they can also conflict on the file because uh, when DNF or you, you install something, uh, the, mm, it will check actually if you can install that package and if mm, there is no conflict between the files. And we also have a software collections. So mm, why modules actually made the way into the realm? Uh, and you can read about it uh, on the Red Hat blog, and I totally agree with that, that uh, there is the only one version of the component. So it's trivial to manage and use. There is no SCU command, there is no alternatives or any other command. You just install it and forget. And that's actually a very, very good thing uh, because uh, there, you know, from uh, different blog posts, you will, can get the information that when it comes to the SEL, it was quite a problem that people, and if you knew about them, but they weren't as popular as they could be because uh, using them wasn't as easy. And everything needed for a specific objective uh, um, is in the single entry point. So, for example, if you install the module that uh, needs, you know, has the specific objective, you the, everything will happen like automatically because the modules include other module dependencies. And what's also extremely important is that modules uh, simplified the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And this also included in this blog post, but this really great when count the modules. Uh, okay. Uh, so Modules have RPMs, but it's quite obvious because Roy is a RPM based system, but they have metadata, and most people will never see that. Uh, and this is how this module metadata looks like. Uh, I decided to put only the most important parts. Uh, so we have the first thing is like the document type actually, and uh, in Roy, uh, right now it's uh, module MD, to, uh, what <laughs> that means module metadata, or uh, module default that will tell which module actually is default. Uh, there is a version of it, it's always version two right now. Uh, and when it comes to the data, you have all these things but define module, like the name, the stream, the version, the context, uh, the architecture, you have the dependencies, so what is required to build the module, we have a profile, so that means that if you install the module, you can, for example, install a minimal version, or you can install a version with development packages. Uh, you have the components that defines uh, how the uh, module sources are actually uh, built and how the module would be, because there is things like the build order when you have the ref, it's uh, the git ref. Uh, there's, of course, version there, and there are also the uh, architectures that are supported for this module. And lastly, you have the artifacts that uh, are RPMs that uh, are included in this module. And there is the, another thing that I uh, really dislike about this. Uh, and even so, the first thing is the stream, but mm, the stream is actually the version of module, but you have a version that is actually more like build, ID, time thing. Uh, you have the context that it's really not used. When it comes to the arches of the module, uh, the, this is not in this example, but there are the modules that have only no arch, uh, so like universal packages that can be installed on any architecture and well, they could be no R right here, but they always have, but but these modules always have the architecture of a main repository. Okay, so when it comes to the platforms, uh, it might be confusing uh, because this platform is not like Enterprise Unit 8, but there is like this dot version and more information. And this is great uh, for Red Hat Enterprise Unit, especially when you think about the extended support that Red Hat offers. Uh, but users for anyone else. Uh, uh, when it comes to the profiles, the profiles also might be a little bit confusing. Be uh, for example, in Node.js, you have a development and source to image profile, and they are exactly the same. Uh, and when it comes to how the uh, artifacts are like put into the modules, metadata, you have the Apple. Uh, and 
I will be honest, I really dislike this way of writing down the uh, writing down the uh, RPM version. I get that from the maintainer perspective, the epoch is extremely important, but it's always hidden from the user because, uh, well, let's be honest, uh, no one writes epoch as a maintainer. But it's right here. So my biggest problem with metadata, of course, is the name stream. Uh, and can you imagine when you go to your colleague, your client, your department, whatever, and which Postgres stream are you running? It's like, no, you always would say the version. And actually, uh, of course, there is this uh, old sense of stream job, that sense of stream is a downstream for Ray based on the upstream of enterprise Linux Nets initiative, that is done through Fedora. Uh, there is another the name called Collision that will don't make anything better. Uh, and if you look in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux documentation, that, uh, by the way, is, in my opinion, one of the best documentations. The word may be the Postgres documentation as good as real documentation. Uh, there's all, <laughs> there is also the, uh, uh, the information that stream is organization of content by the version. So uh, I would actually change that. But the version is not like this, but the stream will uh, I'll change that like. Yeah. So the, the, the stream will be version, it will be the build ID or something like it instead of a version of the module metadata. Okay. Mm. So we'll right now go to the part two. Uh, so the user perspective of the modules. And I will say that I really love it because it just works. Um, user or administrator, DevOps, whatever, need to run like five commands, and uh, that's all. We all remember, the, I remember, I believe that all, um, the, all the most people remember the drama uh, when the uh, rail changed the instance of the system D. And when you look at the difference when it comes to the usage, uh, between the version seven and eight, there is no such difference. And one of the biggest differences actually modules, but as I said, is like five commands and everyone does learn like this. Uh, the very next thing is that the rate, uh, row eight is definitely the most robust when it comes to the software selection. So I remember on the enterprise in seven, if you wanted to install Nginx or what, or different software, uh, it was always the problem, use the uh, third party repositories. Uh, but right now, no, like most of it, uh, most of the most popular software is right here, right now, including the rail. Uh, and it's really great, but it can, uh, I will, sorry, I will say different, but it will backfire a little bit. Uh, the, the very next thing that I really like is, uh, it's still mixed. It's not like uh, modularity took everything. No, it's still mixed. And there are SCLs, like uh, GNU C compiler tool set, that is actually SCL. You can still use the alternatives. So you have this freedom. Uh, modules can be named, like this package is what I say, but have the different versions. Uh, for example, Python 3.8, Python 3.9, and so on. And most modules have a really nice name and versions, streams, so uh, user always know what will install. Okay. Um, the next thing about the modules is that they might be hard to discover. And this is like, in my opinion, I won't hate that because this is uh, uh, like this. So uh, it's also taken from this a real blog post, but the simplest way to think about it is that we can hide part of the repository from the package manager. Uh, we can create virtual repositories within one physical repository, and we call these virtual repositories the application streams. So this is like the design decision, uh, but for some users, things like yum provides, yum search, uh, in, or DNF search, DNF pro what provides, uh, is broken. But as I said, uh, uh, 
uh, in my opinion, this is like the design decision that makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, of course, that means that sometimes uh, you have to know what you are looking for uh, before you start looking <laughs> in the repository. Okay. Uh, sometimes module, modules are well, and in my opinion, this is one of the most prominent uh, example that the modules connected with Perl uh, in many places are broken, like extremely broken, and use the any distribution that uh, is clone of Red or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you will see that if you uh, list the modules, you get the short information that the Perl version uh, 5.26 is the default. Uh, then you will install the Git. But it's like, well, it's like um, most basic software for any developer or uh, on the most systems. Uh, and it will not enable this module. And this module is not enabled, by the way. Uh, then if you try to install the different per version, it will be broken. And the source for this information is actually that you can do it yourself. Is it like three commands? Uh, yeah. The other thing, and that is extremely broken about the modules, and I believe that this is the elephant in the room, and I uh, just checked also the new real version, uh, and I will show it to you. But in my opinion, there's an extremely severe problem with the modules, but the users, are unaware of the module life cycle. If you put the, your module info, you won't get the information that this module uh, will hit end of life shortly, for example. And this is also why I, uh, what I um, well say that I don't represent the company that I'm working for, because in my opinion, if you are, if you don't know the life cycle of the system of the, and the modules, it's unsafe to run enterprise Linux. Like extremely unsafe. And I will just show it to you. Uh, give me a second. And that the module should be retired. If the module hit the end of life, it should be retired. And right now, about the ten modules already reach the reti uh, retirement date. But according to my knowledge, and I might be wrong, I hope that I'm wrong, but uh, I just checked some of this uh, before of course, the presentation. Uh, there is no mechanism place to do that. When it comes to the RPMs, you can always put uh, the, but when, for example, a new version uh, conflicts and obsolete the different version of different package and so on. So it's this logic for, uh, deprecation is already in place. When it comes to the modules, no. In my opinion, and uh, I believe that this might be able to, uh, yes, it's, no, sorry, it's that a strong opinion. They should be removed or at least moved to another repo. Mm. And if you look, uh, I always included the sources for this information. So uh, there is Ray, Ray 8. Uh, support policy for different streams. You can go to the uh, Taiga and Modularity project, and you will see that uh, the third epic is the epic for uh, life cycle of the module. And this epic is not completed. And let's be honest, we are talking about the enterprise Linux, especially Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the most stable platform. And for me, it's quite shocking that uh, there is no such mechanism in place for users. And uh, yeah, um, the most prominent example right now is Node.js 10, because like two weeks ago, there was a rata for Node.js uh, 12 and Node.js 14, but no, but because I will show this uh, right now, if you, we look at the modules uh, and the support policy, 
but now they extend his retirement date. And if you look at the product errata for Node.js, you won't find this important security and bug fix update for Node.js 10. In the very same time, uh, because I checked before this presentation, uh, there is the new Red Hat release. Of course, it's better release. But let's look at it. We have the Node.js modules. Actually, there is the new version, like 16. It wasn't, and it's not included in uh, 8.4. And so we will have the version 16, 14, 12, and 10. And which one is default? The version that is already hit is end of life. It's not security. Uh, there is no security update for it. It's the default version. And for me, it's a little bit shocking. Uh, and that's why I thought that if you don't know what you are doing, if you just want to uh, let user uh, just install things and you don't have uh, some mechanism in place to like, mitigate this uh, thing that the modules have a different life cycle than the base OS, that's well. In my opinion, it's quite a big problem. Uh, last year, there was a very good, good discussion on the CentOS mailing list about if there should be the auto update on the systems. And even with all auto update and all these things, the user that install Red Hat Enterprise Linux or any clone, uh, or, but they might think, yeah, I will just put module install Node.js and it will install the old version, but hit the retirement date. So, yeah. Uh, and when I was talking with some of our clients, uh, it's like they are unaware of that there's some part of the system won't be supported uh, as long as, for example, base OS that will be supported for 10 years. And um, in my opinion, it should be fixed. And it should be fixed uh, quite soon. Okay. Uh, and I decided to put like the three angry point boys here because, in my opinion, it's like the biggest issue with modules. Okay. The other thing that might be a little bit problematic, especially uh, with the different organization, that modular packages are not well supported by management software. So a lot of people, are, especially big companies, are using the Spacewalks, uh, Red Hat uh, satellites. Uh, Catero, Foreman, whatever, okay? And mm, they don't have like the normal uh, HTTP mirrors. Uh, they, they want something that will collect all the information about the system. They will print the errata for the system and other things. So we have the central console for the fleet of the uh, hosts. And uh, if you look on the spacework mailing list in June, uh, the Avi Miller, uh, I hope that I said it correctly, uh, wrote that the updates made to Racco Linux Manager 10 to better support modules is based on Racco Linux module metadata and is likely to work with CentOS 8 or CentOS 8 stream. In the very same time, the other project that uh, might be a little bit popular, so we are going to the Manager uh, and Vespoini, or ho however you should pronounce it. Uh, there is the information that traditional clients are not available on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 clients are only supported by assault clients. Uh, and, well, the only solution, if you really want to have that full control, you should go with Red Hat Satellite. That's why I said Red Hat Satellite for the win, because it's the only product that can really support all of this modular metadata and so on. Okay. There is always the problem with different releases. By the way, all modules produced by, you know, Rocky, Alma, uh, Oracle, Euro, Linux, whatever, Red Hat, uh, they also have the same context, but most of them have uh, 
uh, different module releases. This is actually the thing that uh, put the on development of this distro that I'm working for like a few months back because our clients told us, you know what? It's confusing for static security analyzers. Sorry, guys. It's uh, you have the everyone knows that uh, the rel is like the optimal, it's like the, the, general, the best in class. And uh, we should, people should, if you want to create the clone and your clone actually have the different uh, releases of packages, it's quite, well, it's not a good clone. And uh, lots of software actually won't uh, run, for example, libraries to check if this library or program have some security issues. No, it will just ask about the version in many, cases we might ask for example about the rpm version and they will check the database that's all so uh, if you have a static security analyzer uh, that might work this way and well uh, good luck if you are not using virgin enterprise linux good luck uh, the other thing is that errata become more tedious to create i know i know i know uh, not all uh, systems who have ratas and uh, it's quite a good question if you know the clones should have them and so on. But yeah, but for for me it might be a problem and yeah. Uh, and the source for this information is just running the U module info on the Swig module 4.0. Okay, the last part of this presentation is maintainer perspective. And uh, one of this perspective is uh, my very own. So let's go. And I believe that this is bad. Quite extremely bad. One of the very first projects that we used for uh, for creating modules was Fedora Module Orchestrator. And you can go there right now. And there will be the readme, like an all good software that will tell you how to contribute, how to develop, how to test, and what this software can do. And this project has the broken links in the readme. And we all know that, especially on the GitHub and other things I get, uh, you know, this like your business card, it should be good. And broken links are not very uh, mm, welcoming. I don't know how to, uh, yeah, but this is not a good thing. So uh, the most, the other things, but the most popular problem with open source project and uh, there was open source survey, the GitHub made the uh, studies about it, and everyone knows that the biggest problem with the open source is incomplete or confusing documentation. And yeah, one of the most important projects, uh, well, it, it does not do right now good. Okay, uh, the other thing that I uh, I have very, I had very good problem with it. We had actually in the company, uh, but there is no co-build system. And in my opinion, people might disagree to tie with it. Uh, this ABC of software development, no co-build, no production. Mm, the large part of the unicorn project book that is uh, made by Jim Kim, Kim or something like it. Uh, I might just say his name wrong. Uh, the guy who made the uh, Project Phoenix books uh, that actually, uh, according to some people that I know, and in my opinion, just perfectly um, show how to make the good software and how the DevOps movement started. And uh, yeah, these books actually, start with that there is no local build system and when we think about for example the uh, containers why 
why containers won? Why they are so popular? Why are so popular because uh, the namespaces are so great and C groups are much better than uh, other things? No, they are so popular because everyone, every developer on every laptop, on every small host, or even on Raspberry Pi can run it. And without the local build system, it's like, in my opinion, as the greatest tool said about the ARM. Right now I'm finishing the our version of the real clone on, on ARM and well uh, if you cannot buy the if you cannot buy even the good hardware well you have to wait for a workstation there is no laptop for it and uh, there are like four mm, companies that are producing servers and what you can buy and you because of the coronavirus supply chain uh, breakdown and other things you have to wait for it um well we landed using AWS and Raspberry Pis, like literally. Even the MacBook, uh, <laughs> the new Apple uh, MacBook, but there is a problem because the M1 chip actually don't like the Red Hat Enterprise Linux page size because it's uh, 64 bytes and it works only with 4 and 16. Uh, some people might say that Model Bit Service Manager has the ability to build model locally. Uh, long time ago, no, like quite a long time ago, it was like more than a year ago, uh, we was able to build about 20% of modules with it because of the uh, problem with virtual uh, modules, because of a problem with mocks that are just not working and other things uh, and what is uh, even in my opinion uh, might be a little bit um, uh, for some maybe hard to understand but we have a lot of abstraction layers right now because you have airplane build but will actually with this modular package it will all the packages but will be invoked by mock yeah the modular packages also uses mock you have the uh, Koji or uh, Open Build service. Uh, to this day, I'm not sure if Open Build service actually support building modules. Uh, and then you have uh, another abstraction layer, the module build service. And well, from my perspective, it's a little bit complicated. You can go to the uh, mbox.centos.org uh, or whatever the URL for the Centos uh, build system right now is. And if you look at the, how the modules are built, it's extremely confusing, in my opinion. The very next thing is that everything right now is quite Koji centric, and I'm not sure if it's the right way because um, if the thing that actually build the ISO images, but well, it just needs the bunch of repos. Uh, actually, need the Koji running to build the ISO images properly, or a lot of hacking to do that other way and uh, well i'm i'm not fan of it uh, and the fact that you cannot build modules easy locally uh, that makes a uh, modules big boy club so if you have a koji that is quite hard to set up let's be honest i remember when i was trying to set up koji it was like the week uh, maybe it could be shorter, but I decided it was an Ansible when I was learning it. So, uh, so it's not like someone think I will make the module and I can start like in ten minutes. No, of course, probably people who are more connected with Fedora and all this old magic thing like Fedora package. Um, maybe, maybe it's easier that way. So let's say um, before um, I'm not expert in the Fedora ecosystem, Koji ecosystem, because we are not using it. We made our own system that is able to produce modules from scratch. And uh, the heart of the system is still mock. Uh, and let's face it, to build the module uh, in the simple and reproducible way, 
you just need the proper mock config with the temporary repo with temporary RPM that will be named like module build, build uh, macros or whatever. So yeah, mm. there's always the source for this information about how the modules are. But modules can in theory be built locally, but uh, at least me as a person and people who I'm working with, when like twenty percent of modules actually will build. Yeah. The, the other thing that I really dislike, but very like useless modules, and the modules are not public. This is a broad issue, but a lot of things is not public. And as I can get that, all companies uh, want this is the trade secret. This is like the special sauce that the magic that happens to that the virtual enterprise is so good. So it's obvious that. Uh, at the end of the day, we have open source, but uh, we want to keep, we need money right? to make the great things. We need a great amount of money. So I get that Red Hat decided, for example, that the developer packages won't be, uh, won't be uh, published by, but, uh, well, um, I don't get why other distributions, especially the distribution that said that we are the community-driven distribution, especially the new one uh, that were just created, they are doing the very same thing. Uh, we do not publish a lot of modules. Uh, you know, so I will go maybe to the points that there is, for example, the module called Golang Ecosystem. It contains single RPM. Uh, it's not public, but if you want to rebuild Go, you need going ecosystem, and <laughs> good luck. Uh, the other things, for example, the Perl YAM bootstrap, that is required to rebuild the Perl YAM. Uh, but this module actually has the Perl YAM. So instead of going with filtering and other things, uh, I, I have no idea why there is the bootstrap for it. Uh, there are also new Java packages tools, but I, for example, required to create the Maven 3.6, but are also not public. I get that a lot of bootstraps are also not public, but come on, in version of Python, it bootstrap, in version of Perl, LVM, Rust tools, and much, much, much more. None of this is public. And I would like to ask a very philosophical question. Because the second, uh, long, long time ago, the uh, man that is much smarter than me, in the very, but I, I'm not saying that I like him, uh, <laughs> but he uh, made the four uh, like uh, rules, rules of open, um, of free software. But let's be honest, the open source is based on. And the second freedom that he proposed is that it's the freedom to study the program and change it so it does your computing as you wish. And of course, access to the source code is precognition to this. But let's think this is quite a philosophical question. And change so it does your computing as you wish. Does your computing as you wish. If you have a program that you change because you have a source code, but the build process is so close or so or very hard to mimic or next to impossible to mimic. Or the, the parts of a build system that are not public, broken, whatever. Can you really tell that this is the free software? And this is a philosophical question, and I believe that everyone can uh, check it. Uh, by the way, there was also the time that the Koji, uh, CentOS Koji was closed. And for me, it's still like, I have no idea why. Uh, okay, so the next thing is that there are multiple that are split. And mm, well, this is not a big thing because you have a Python, like three, a double, MariaDB double, and Vue double, that contains actually artifacts that are, well, in our case, came from the one build. Uh, the one build, and this module is artificially split into two modules. 
Um, yeah, so this is the other thing. And there was also a lot of changes and different requirements, actually, but it was about the two of them right here is the bug, but you have, if you want to install the MariaDB double, you have to, you need MariaDB double instead of MariaDB, so I believe that it was a bug. Uh, and there is also the enhancement in the second and the third, that uh, the PHP uh, 7.2 uh, actually uh, started when the engine was just one version. And right now, it should work with all of them. OK. Uh, the other thing that uh, I believe that should change when it comes to the modules, the first and most important thing was documentation for modules and how to build modules and how to do and how to, what is the policy for, for example, the retirement policy for changing things in modules. Uh, yeah, so it should be documented. Uh, in my opinion, everyone who uh, likes the enterprise in Linux and uh, should read the uh, federal mailing list. Uh, it's listed the source 14 in this presentation. Uh, and this complaint thread is full of small examples. Like I just said, that there are things that are broken in many places. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, as I said, the build rules, the builders were removed from the distro. Uh, and I was shocked because the Oracle actually is a good guy uh, in, in that case, because they started with distro builder right, right away. Uh, and this was quite shocking. There is also the thing that is not on the slide by I um, before this presentation. And I decided I'll also tell about it that. Uh, Fedora has a policy to make the mass rebuild of packages. And in my opinion, this is a very good policy. Because, well, you can have the old package that will work as the compiled package, but if you need to fix it in a very short time, you will discover that, well, you cannot compile it. Because, I, for example, the uh, compiler version required, but it uh, well, it's obsolete or very old or whatever. And uh, the very same things, actually, in my opinion, is like one of the things that modules are missing, but you can find the modules that are not, you cannot rebuild right now. And uh, as I can get that, uh, it might provide unnecessary change to the stability. Uh, in my opinion, uh, especially when you think about the more developing platform, uh, still very stable, extremely stable, like sense of stream. Uh, it might be quite a good policy, but once more, uh, more documentation is required. Uh, summary of my presentation. Uh, modules are a great idea. Like, come on, splitting system into the smaller things and that these things are so robust and uh, that users have a more software by default is a great idea. Uh, modules are hard to maintain, unfortunately, right now. Uh, in my opinion, modules are not mature yet, uh, especially when you think about that. Well, a lot of things are not in place, and how do you obsolete the module, for example? Uh, and I strongly believe that in the future they won't mature. Um, especially when you think about how many uh, extremely talented programmers are working uh, in the Red Hat and in the Fedora. Uh, so I believe that even if my presentation was uh, in many cases, uh, well, I hope that in many cases I might be wrong and I get that. Uh, I still believe that there's a very bright future in front of the modules. And that's probably also there is the question and answer. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, 
I would like any questions. It would be very nice. Well, thank you for that presentation. If anyone has any questions, please do put them in the Q&A tab. All right. Um, not seeing any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for this presentation.